so welcome everyone to the second talk of the day so the second talk of the day is by dr pollock ayach so dr pollock ayach is currently a associate professor at nizer bhubaneswar before joining joining nizer bhubaneswar he was uh, he, uh, he was in the he was leading the bovine enteric disease group as a pi uh, at widow in the university of saskatchewan at canada uh, and in canada he also uh received a uh, canada innovation award for inventing a novel form of pna mdna in nizer bhubaneswar his work mainly focuses on understanding the effect of uh, psychological stress on gut microbiota and also the effect of gut microbiota on brain so we are very eager to hear from you thank you okay thank you parul and thanks project msaflan and especially tanya for um, inviting me to this great occasion this is my first time i am actually interacting and um, well i have lot to explain about the title and so on so i first warn the audience because i guess based on the information i heard that this would be a very heterogeneous uh, group uh, audience so i try to plan the talk in such a way uh, where there would be a lot of popular popular kind of information so that uh, the main objective is that people understand something like this now so for example when i say the title is another gaba the immediate thing that came in mind and i uh, tested it with some of the people before this talk they all thought this neurotransmitter gamma minus butyric acid but here this is not that gaba so that's why i said another gaba so this is the short form or the acronym of gut adipose brain axis the gamma and and why do i say the scepter the reason is that scepter is the symbol of power and we are talking here about the power the distribution how the energy in in the in terms of power uh, is basically distributed among these few parameters the players like the gut adipose tissue and brain and and this is very very important because when we talk about energy um in general based on our overall academic background we think of in terms of you know energy mass conservation and you know whenever energy there is mass whenever there is mass there is energy and that's exactly how biological system works so basically i will start with something which is a conversation on energy mass conservation and that is how i would like to uh, understand and project my understanding uh, about this enter gut brain relationship so let's start since we know about you know uh, energy homeostasis now homeostasis is a very overtly used or maybe abused word in biology in life science because anything we talk about life there is there is a uh, reason for balancing i mean we also heard from the previous speaker uh, dr krishna he was also mentioning and some of you also asked the question about like is the more sleep good and then he talked about do we want more sleep or do we need more sleep and all those kind of things so we are talking about a balance right and here i am talking about the energy balance and that is basically the internal stability for an organism now we always think about you know demand supply so supply dissipation equilibrium how much energy we intake how much energy we spend so energy intake energy expenditure balance but is that all if that is the case then what is the role of the internal energy that we have already in, inside the body because if it is just equilibrium between intake and expenditure then could you see that we would be maintaining a constant mass and if that is the case then obesity would be a paradox now the worldwide epidemic of increased obesity in humans could become a myth and we would be all very happy but is that true probably not let let's see so energy homeostasis the way we see it it fulfills 
the energy need of a body, right? So we reduce or induce input when output decreases or increases. That's the concept. But if that is the case, then you see if energy needs are efficiently supplied when environmental conditions are appropriate, say, for example, um, we reduce in the energy intake. Could it be sufficient to exclude increased energy storage when energy expenditure is low? Say, for example, physical activity level is low? No. So we are saying that probably it is not exactly uh, equilibrium between input and output. So mechanisms of energy homeostasis seem to be poorly efficient against excessive energy intake in individuals. And that's how this schema, which was published a few years back, is actually not showing a direct interaction between the total energy expenditure or T and the energy intake EI. There are some endogenous energy storage and that level, if it goes positive, if it goes negative, if we have gain in mass, get loss in mass, or we stay neutral, it would have different impact. And a lot of things actually would regulate. So that means energy utilization, which would be basically what is our intake expenditure and the storage of these interactions is no more just a state function. That means, as I said, the way the balance we see the equilibrium between the demand and supply is not anymore true. Rather, energy homeostasis is a path function. And as a result of this, homeostasis is rather a homeoresis. And what is homeoresis? It's basically a phenomenon by which an internal state is maintained over time. So that's why it is important. The time is very important. So you can see this is a kinetic mechanism. It's not just a given time point measurement. And that's why in biological experiment, time match control becomes very, very important. And when people understood this, they started formulating various theories. So the very first theory is known as set point theory, where they actually try to correlate a portion of the brain, hypothalamus, and the internal fat tissues, which are responsible for storage of fat, the white adipose tissue, or in other words, this mass correlation came as a first theory where they say to defend energy homeostasis that whether a voluntary or involuntary changes, that means, you know, whether we want it or don't want it there would be a balance for, about this path from the intake to the expenditure. And that makes the energy homeostasis concept an ancillary mechanism. So basically that led to the lipostatic model, which says that the fat mass of a body is regulated at the hypothalamic levels, again, a part of the brain, so that it remains constant in varied environmental conditions. Now you can immediately see the drawback or the loophole in this theory. Since now we are relating fat cells to satiety, how? That means if you have more fat, you might require less food intake. And it is true to some extent, and few years later, it was even supported by the discovery of leptin, but then it was not the best model because when people have surgical lipectomy, where leptin has no role, and it also shows different spatial localization of the fat storage, and also dependence on the food intake, the kind of food intake, then certainly this lipostatic model doesn't hold true. So what do we do then? People found there is much more robust system is in place in the brain, the sympathetic nervous system, which actually is responsible for it in, in stress, which you will be probably hearing uh, soon after this talk about the sympathetic nervous system, the activity of it, the fright and flight experience, which would try to reduce the total energy expenditure and in 
and more lipolysis, the breakdown of the fat with increased energy input because the SNS, the fight and flight response, is a feedback mechanism. So if that be the case, then immediately a modification of the theory came and that is probably the most interesting part of this entire understanding is that overeating in the active period was associated with increased fat synthesis. Well, that is very common sense and followed by reduced food intake. Now, this is the brilliance of this particular modification of the theory that increased lipolysis in the rest period. So if there is overeating associated with during the activity period, when a body is highly active. So this becomes a more flexible metabolic model and in which fat mass stabilization was achieved when the main respiratory quotient. Now, what does that mean? That means the burning of the food. So when you are taking fat, carbohydrate and things like that. So the proportion of the fat and carbohydrate metabolized with the rate of the metabolism, that means the burning, when this equilibrium reaches, then you have actually the entire homeuresis is happening. That means it is trying to tell the macronutrient content of the diet and the oxidative capacities would be a prerequisite for accurate energy homeostasis or energy homeuresis, since EH could represent both. So it could be considered as a stochastic value. And people are trying to find out, to understand this stochastic process, the equilibrium between these two quotients, the respiratory and the food intake or the energy intake, there would be, we need to know all the determinants. And this is the major challenge today is to accumulate the exhaustive inventory of this determinant. So people are working on that. We are also working on that. So basically we are trying to say that if our intake can be anticipatory and based on the need, so we can anticipate needs and prepare our body to satisfy them before they arise. So that if you think there would be a time for a, a severe hunger or starvation, maybe people would eat more and be active more. So a predictive model in opposition to a reactive model becomes very, very important. And we could immediately see as a result of that human brain grew because the metabolism accelerates. What does this mean? Metabolic acceleration and the brain size so this is the hypothesis that was highly proven and published few years back in Nature. I will show you the data. It shows that the body size and physical activity of human total ex energy expenditure exceeded that of all other apes, which are the uh, closest uh, relatives by significant amount of energy. But did, this didn't actually affect our longevity and the reproductivity, right? So humans also has the greatest body fat percentage compared to the other apes. So basically an increased metabolic rate and this increased body fat percentage, which is the internal storage, along with changes in energy allocation is crucial in the evolution of human brain size and life history. So this is basically the data that shows brain size, the activity level, the reproduction and the lifespan in every case, human is significantly higher than its closest relatives. So if that is the case, then where is the role of gut? And we haven't talked about gut because I just wanted to initially give you the idea that how this energy is um, linking our, uh, to the present day brain size and, and the activity. So now you see, during development, people have already established this parasympathetic neurons of both the gut and the brain originate from the neural crest. And this is basically the thing that shows your digestions, your resting period. So it's a parasympathetic the opposite to the sympathetic which shows about your flight-flight feedback mechanism. Now it is showing about the 
uh, utilization. So this common origin could explain why many gut secreted hormones and peptides and their receptors are also found in the brain. They originated very similarly. So basically what happens when the gut under the guidance of the central nervous system and the brain, the energy homeostasis can be well maintained only when the brain gut circuit is synchronized. And this synchronization, as I said, happens through hunger and the satiety. And there are gut satiety signals. There are many peptides and hormones. Some of them are listed here. They become afferent through vagal sensory. And then you have this NTS, the nucleus tract of solitarius in the hindbrain, which is one of the major processor of these incoming vagal signals. And then they regulate basically the metabolism. And you could see the detailed structures are understood, but not the entire mechanisms. We know this particular NTSAP, the area postrema, they actually interact with some of these gut hormones and also this arcuate nucleus, this insulin, ghrelin, so that our hunger and the utilization of uh, the carbohydrate, the energy source, and, and other portions related to the hypothalamus. I'm not getting into all these details because there is already a, a nice uh, schema shown here that shows different parts of the gut here um, that is producing various this uh, kind of uh, like peptides and hormones, which has the receptors in the brain, different parts, and as well as another endocrine system, which is the adipose tissue. So I said that this is a scepter. So we talked about gut and brain, I mean, very briefly, and there are many more actually there to know, but considering the time, I'm just telling you this gut is an important endocrine organ that target also adipose tissue and regulate metabolism. Because as I said, adipose tissue, there are two kinds. One is about overtly, the majorly is the storage, other is for the expenditure. So they regulate metabolism, the energy balance, they link between your energy intake and the expenditure, EIE. And also there are evidence that suggests this gut microbiome, which is another big resident and, you know, I can talk more probably through this question answer because if I start talking about that, I mean, one talk is not enough. So these are different kinds of bacteria, viruses, bacteriophages, uh, fungus, and so on. So various different microbes, mostly the bacteria, they also affect the thermogenic capacity of the fat tissues or the brown fat tissues, the conversion of the white, the storage to the thermogenic properties, and then this adipose tissue, which are now also regulated by gut, where the microbiome is regulating gut and vice versa. So this adipose tissue now also has another role. These are not dynamically accumulates and releases lipids, but also acts as an endocrine organ. So you can see the signaling is the most important part. They have various roles. While adipose tissue is doing accumulating or releases lipids, it also produces various molecules known as adipokines, like that goes to the brain, inform the brain about the whole body long-term energy storage status, and then it drives the brain's control of energy balance and the long-term regulation of body weight. So in terms of adipose tissue crosstalk with the central nervous system, the best study adipokine is leptin, Although adiponectin, resistin, ethylene, there are many others being studied. And there are specific signaling pathways and functionalities in the central nervous system to regulate. So what we are observing here, accounts to keep, is the bidirectionality. That means it's while gut is sending information to adipose, to brain, brain is also receiving information from adipose, brain is also sending information to the gut and the whole body system. So in any part of this M GABA or microbiome GABA, 
the microbiome to gut, gut to adipose, and gut to brain, or adipose to brain, these are all bidirectional. So I stop here, hope I leave some time for interesting Q&A. Thank you for your attention, and hopefully things that got your attention during this talk also created equivalent or more confusion than understood. Thank you very much.